Okay, am I on? I'm on. Hello, thank you for coming. <clears throat> uh, welcome to Crash Boom Report. Uh, this is a brand new talk for me that I'm bringing in in 2019. I literally gave it for the first time on Thursday last week at NBC's event in Oslo, so literally brand new. And before we start, I just want to give you a tiny little bit of background information because it's relevant to, to something that I'm going to talk about uh, in the talk in a moment, and you'll see what I mean. So my name's Scott. You may have seen me. I'm usually on the Twitters. Uh, I also blog a lot. But I want to talk just a tiny little bit about this project that I started uh, almost four years ago now, actually. Free project, side thing, grew into um, a really big side project and then into a company and on. And Report URI, uh, we're a real-time security reporting company. So basically, we take these reports that get sent to us, which is what we're going to talk about very soon. We ingest them, process them, filter them. We make pretty graphs and dashboards. And I mentioned this. You'll see why this is relevant in, in a moment in the talk. So that's who we are. That's what we're doing. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. But to get things kicked off, I want to actually just start with a question. So this is a, an open question to, to the floor, to everybody here. And that is, what's a browser? Like, what, what does a browser do? What's its purpose? When, you th when I say web browser, like, what do you think of as the actual reason a browser exists? Someone? Go on, shout out and answer. Show me stuff. Show me stuff, right? That's a really good one. It's a thing to show you stuff. Like you say, I'm going to go here. There's this resource online that I want to go see, and I would like you to show that to me. Many different browsers all essentially serve the same purpose, right? Like, I want to go to this online resource. Maybe it's a blog. Maybe I'll read it. Just like this. You type in the address. You go there, and it renders a web page for you. Now, this is like a really traditional view of a browser, right? It's like a, a portal to some online stuff. You type in an address, you go to a place, and you read a thing. However, in this talk, what I want to look at is that browsers have become much more than just the ability to go view something. They're becoming, rather than the portal through which someone looks at our website or our application, they're the thing that can participate in the process. Rather than just being like, here's a page, look at it, they become more actively involved. Because it's really important that the browser functions, that the things that we want to happen actually do happen. Think about a typical browsing scenario, right? Like, you really want people to come to your site. You really want it to work. User comes to your website, sends a request over to the web server. And on the server side, we have all of these different things that we might use to track if something happened, right? Like, is my application working? Are there errors? Is everything running quickly, efficiently, highly performant? So we, we want all of this information. We want to know this. I'm sure. I used to use New Relic, recently moved to Paper Trail, but I'm sure there's loads of others that people here will use because we want to know that this process worked. And likewise on the return back, actually. When we send the page back, it's not necessarily just like, hey, here's the HTML, please render it. We're seeing a lot of client-side things to help us with error tracking again. Um, you've probably seen TrackJS on the sponsorship list here. So Todd Gardner runs that. Really good client-side error tracking for JavaScript. Because we want to know, like, did this process work? Did this process complete? But there's actually lots of different ways that this can go wrong where nothing on this screen can help you. So if we think about this example that I set up here, it says down here at the bottom, DNS probe finished NX domain, which means I did a DNS lookup for this domain, and no record exists for it. So something has gone wrong. The browser's tried to come to our website, and something has prevented it from getting there. If you think about this scenario, then, in the context of, of this diagram that we just looked at and all of these tools that we use to help us make sure our application is working properly, then actually, if the DNS lookup didn't work, then this request never goes. Because if we do the DNS lookup and try and resolve the domain and it doesn't, then how can we connect? And what that means is if we can't connect, then none of these things can tell us about that. right? Because if it didn't connect, then we have no logs on our server, no server logs, no application logs. Likewise, if there's no request, there's no response, right? One is a result of the other. And if there's no response, there's nothing on the client side that can help us either. So we end up in this scenario where a user started their browser, and they tried to go to your site, to your application, and something broke, and they saw this big full screen error message, but there's no way for us to know that that person is sat there at that error message. And I would really like to know about that, because it could be me that's broken something or one of my service providers. So this is why I want to introduce you to the reporting API in this talk. Now, this is a new feature built into the browser. So this is native browser functionality. Everything we're going to talk about here 
doesn't require the deployment of any code or agents or libraries or anything like that. This is all native browser functionality. So the reporting API, in the instance when the communication breaks down between the browser and the server, and likewise in reverse, typically here we would not hear anything from the browser. The reporting API allows you to change that. If you enable it and configure it for your website, you can ask the browser to send diagnostic information to an external source. Now this is what we do at Report URI, and the browser does this by sending a JSON payload as a post request. Nice little diagnostic report. So this is what we do, this is what we ingest. Super easy to do this on your own. You just need the ability to ingest JSON, store it somewhere, and make pretty graphs so that you can read things. So this is really super easy to do and enable. And in the scenario where the communication between the browser and the server breaks down, you can now start to get feedback from the browser through this out-of-band channel. So it doesn't depend on your host being online for whatever reason that is. You can still learn that you have whatever the problem was. And there's loads of different problems. We're going to look through a few of them now. So if you want to enable the reporting API, because this is native browser functionality, it's super easy to turn on. Right? Like I said, there's no code, no agents, no anything like that. It's a simple HTTP response header. So you set this response header called the report to header. And this is like how you say, hey, browser, if something goes wrong, please report to this location that I specify in the header. So as you can see, it's some JSON in the header. I've broken it out here just so that we can see it a bit more clearly. Now, this is really good because you can actually define multiple reporting groups. We're going to keep it a little bit simple in our examples here with just a single group that I've called default. Now, the second line here, the max age, this is kind of where a lot of the magic comes from. Because if you imagine, this is set as a response header. So if the browser goes to your website, can't resolve the DNS, how's it going to get the response header? Right? Like If you can't connect, there is no response header to set this. So this is why we have max age. Because the first time the browser comes to your site and sees this, it will save and remember this value. So this is actually a persistent thing that you can set in the browser and say, OK, if you ever come back to my website in the next, I think that's like a year in seconds, and something goes wrong, I would like you to send a report to one of these endpoints. Now, I've, again, I've only specified one here for simplicity, but you simply put the URL that you would like the browser to send the JSON payload. So this is, this is pretty much it. Include subdomains. Obviously, it does what it says on the tin. Do you want to apply this to the current domain? and all domains below. So if you set this like on your Apex with include subdomains, you can have full coverage and reporting for all of your sites. And that's how you turn on the reporting API. Right? Like that's it. That's how you say to the browser, when something goes wrong, please send a report. Now this actually just enables the mechanism. This says to the browser, I would like you to send reports when things go wrong. What you need to do next is then subscribe to the different things that can go wrong that you would like information about, because there's lots of stuff that can go wrong. Maybe you don't want information about all of them. So we're going to take a, a look first at something called network error logging. This is something that we just commonly refer to as NEL. Support for this was added in Chrome in September last year, I think it was. So this is essentially still kind of brand new, but this is really powerful. And we're actually seeing some quite fast adoption um, of this standard because of that. So network error logging would cover something like the DNS example that I gave you before. You go to a website, you do the DNS lookup, something doesn't work, I would like to know about that. So these are all the DNS-based errors that Nell will cover. If the browser goes to your website, it does the DNS lookup and it fails, you will get a DNS name not resolved error sent to you to say, hey, this, like, I'm the browser, I tried to come to your website, and from wherever I am, your DNS isn't resolving. That's a problem, because you're not going to have any traffic. And if you suddenly start seeing like loads of these coming in from a particular region, maybe you've got some kind of DNS outage in that region. But things don't just go wrong at DNS. DNS is the very first step of connecting to the site. Maybe something will go wrong at TCP. So again, these are all the currently supported TCP errors that you can get. TCP timeout, connections reset, refused, aborted, couldn't reach the address. So there's lots of different things that, again, if these go wrong at TCP, the browser can't connect. None of your existing like, error logging or monitoring solutions can catch this because the browser never got there. The next slide is my favorite. For those of you that know me, I'm quite into TLS and crypto and things like that. And there are lots and lots of things that we can do wrong with TLS. I know we've seen, I kind of don't want to pick on them a little bit, but the American government thing recently with the, 
the government being closed, lots of their certificates on their websites started expiring because the, the members of staff aren't there to replace them. Now, I know that's kind of like they know that's happening and they're just watching everything burn, but if that happened to your website and a certificate expired in production, it's like, well, you, I'd actually kind of like to know about that because the browser will go to your website, get this big red warning, and they can't proceed. But there's nothing that would tell you unless you introduce Nell. So we've got things here like cert date invalid, it's expired. Maybe it's been revoked, maybe you've served the wrong certificate. Maybe you've got like five domains and there's a misconfiguration. So there's lots of stuff that we can do at the TLS layer that can cause the browser not to connect. And then even if we do connect, there's still things up at HTTP as well. So with things like Nell, you can track errors on your site. So any error-based like 400 or 500 status code, maybe you already have some logging in place for those, maybe not, maybe Nell can cover that. The one that I like the most recently, the redirect loop. I don't know what's happened to, to Google at the minute, but every time I go through that auth flow, I seem to end up in these crazy loops where I need to clear my cookies. But these are the kinds of things that you can get an error message about. If you go to a website and it says, you know, we're not loading this page because there's a redirect loop, you wouldn't necessarily get an error for that in your application log. Nell will tell you. So these are all the things that are currently supported. This list is only going to get bigger and support is only going to get better. But I really want to talk about the, the bad certificate one particularly because this is a thing that keeps happening. And more and more of the web is going to HTTPS. And as more and more of the web goes to HTTPS, like more of us are, are gonna break things and, and get things wrong. So this is the prime example. The certificate's expired. This is a demo website that you can see up in the address bar, but the, the purpose remains the same, right? If the browser comes to your website and sees this, it's not gonna show in your server logs. Maybe you'll notice a drop in traffic because no one's coming anymore, but that, that's not really indicative of what the problem is. So if you want to subscribe to Nell Errors, Network Area Logging Errors, then you have to set the Nell header. So you set report two, that tells the browser where to send the reports. You then set the Nell header to say, I actually want these network error logs. And this is where you send them to. So you define the report two directive, and this refers to the name from the group that we set previously. So I said the group was called default. We would like Nell reports sent to the default group. And again, network error logging, you can configure this cache time independently of the report to header. So you can say, right, I want you to remember this setting for the next one year, and if you come to my website and you hit an error message, or any of those things breaks, I want you to send that report. And this is, th that's it. I kind of left this on one line to, to prove the point of how small this configuration is. Once you've done that, and once you've set it, you will then get null reports on your site. If a browser comes to your website and something goes wrong, it will dispatch that JSON payload to the endpoint that we specified earlier. And this is what it might look like. So we get this nice JSON payload, all conforms to the, the fixed standards, so we can parse these reliably. Type network error, what page was I on? Sampling fraction, if you don't want to get like hosed with potentially, you know, if you've got 10 million visitors a day, you don't want to get 10 million reports all coming at once, so you can downsample with the sampling fraction. Uh, but the really important one here really is the type. So this is the actual error message that we're talking about from the previous slide. I came to this particular page, some kind of error happened, and it was because the date on your certificate is invalid. Usually means that it's expired. So this is really powerful because in that scenario, you typically don't have any other mechanism to learn that, hey, we've got a certificate on our website and you know, something's broken, something's gone wrong, the clients can't get here. But while I say that you don't have another mechanism, normally we do because this, this has happened to some really big websites in the past before. If anyone, if anyone uses Azure, you'll remember this one. It's quite a few years ago now. I think it was before Troy worked there, so he wasn't there to fix everything. And uh, I had to. <laughs> so we actually do have another reporting mechanism to tell us when our website's broken, but it's not really a reporting mechanism that you want to use. Does, can anyone tell what it is? Does anyone know what it is? Twitter. <laughs> so we have this other really reliable kind of reporting and monitoring solution that when your website breaks, you can pretty much guarantee if you have a social media team, they'll know about it first, right? Because all of these tweets start coming out. And again, I don't really want to make light of this because more and more sites are, are deploying HTTPS. And so as a result of that, we're going to see more and more problems like this. But again, you know, banks, Barclays here in the UK, 
They're a pretty big bank. I really like this one. I don't understand. It's like, hey, I went to your website and the certificate's expired. Could you try using a different browser? And they're quite like, <laughs> maybe this different browser operates like in previous time zones or something, and the certificate won't have expired there. But you know, this is really problematic because this was probably the first time they were learning about this when someone tweets their social media team, and then we've got like the, the chain of going through whatever reporting mechanisms they have internally. So this is a really inefficient way of doing it, this. Now, just to clarify, like Nell won't tell you before the error's happened, right? Like you'll only get the, the error report once it's expired. You really should be catching this sooner. However, this is the, the ultimate kind of backstop. When things go wrong, you can know about it quickly and directly. But just to look at how this problem of certificate expiry is actually growing and not shrinking. I run this crawler project online called crawler.ninja. And I have a little, a little fleet of crawlers, and they go around and they scan the top 1 million websites in the world every day. Uh, all of the data is online. Crawler.ninja is actually the site. You can go look at all the raw data. I scan whole heaps of different things about their security configurations. But one of the things that I scan in particular is related to their certificate. So, <laughs> The first line here is sites in the largest top one million in the world that are actually using an expired certificate at the time that I scanned them. And I actually have a little bit of time, so we're going to jump out and take a look at this. Because I did this last week in Norway, and the demo went fantastically well. So up on crawler.ninja, we have the, the raw data files that you can see here. And we're going to take a look through these ones now. So first of all, oh, what happened? Thank you for pointing that out. It didn't automatically switch back to duplicate mode. Thank you. So here we go. Go on crawler.ninja. You can see here we have uh, the raw files directory. We're going to look through these ones here. So I, I did this jokingly in Norway last week, and I was like, OK, so let's have a look at sites that are expiring in the next seven days. Right? These are sites who very, very soon might actually get one of these NEL reports if they've subscribed. So it just tells you their rank. So this site is the 480,000th and third ranked site in the world. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through, actually, see if there's any .gov. I did this in Norway last week with .no. So there's no .govs in there, which is probably good. So we'll go back. That was a seven-day expiries. Have a look at those expiring in three days. Do we have any .govs? Oh, we do. Poland. And we went through this, and we actually found one that was due to expire, and it actually expired at the end of my talk, and the site went down, um, which was a bit awkward. So let's have a look at the expired ones and see if we can find one in here. Because there's generally speaking, and also I have no idea what these sites are, so I'll alt F4 really quickly if it's not appropriate. So there we go. This site is ranked, what was their rank? This is the 54,000th largest site in the world. And they're currently not working because they're serving an expired certificate. So, I mean, they probably have people yelling at them on Twitter, or maybe they're already fixing this. But my question really is, like, how do we get here? Like, A, how do we get to the expiry? Because you shouldn't really get there. But B, if this happens, if this is your user's experience when they come to your website, you really, really want to know about this, right? Like, and this is what Nell will do. We have um, Misbehaving Site as well. Has anyone used Misbehaving Site before? Misbehaving Site is a site that you can go to that will do all kinds of things wrong intentionally. So there's a redirect loop in here that we can trigger. So again, if we go to the redirect loop, Click on that. Obviously, it's now sat in the background, stuck in a loop, and eventually the browser will just give up and say, oh, this, this website's just redirecting and redirecting and redirecting forever. I quit. Error, too many redirects. Maybe there's a, a broken redirect in your authentication flow. In the background, this browser will have now dispatched a report to say, hey, I tried to get to your site, and this thing didn't work as expected. But this isn't just the only thing that we have. Nell is not the only reporting mechanism in the browser. There's actually quite a few. Nell's really good. I like focusing on Nell because it covers this huge range of scenarios that we're seeing more and more, like certificates expiring. But there's actually loads of different ones. All of these were added in September last year as part of, uh, I can't remember the current release version, but they're, they're literally brand new. So we've looked at network error logging. I want to look at deprecation reports as well, because this was a big one that hit quite a few sites here in the UK a few years ago. So I think most people have probably been to a website and, and tried to go to like a store locator like this. I travel around a lot doing training. I'll open up the store locator and be like, right, where's my nearest Sainsbury's? Where's my nearest Tesco's? I need to go buy some supplies for my hotel room. And you press on the little coordinate icon up here, 
and it would look at your GPS coordinates and, and plot a route to your nearest store. Except this page, as it stands right now, won't work. I can guarantee that this won't work. Can anyone tell me why it won't work? No, I GPS. Not over, that was really fast. You've worked on this before. This page won't work because it's going to try and use the geolocation API in the browser. It's going to try and access the device's location. Now, you can, your page can ask a device this and say, literally, give me your GPS coordinates. OK, this has a legitimate use. You'd get like a little um, kind of permission prompt. Do you want to allow this device to access your location? Yes. And then it would plot the route. But Chrome said, well, your, your GPS coordinates, they're kind of sensitive information, right? We talk about personally identifiable information being sent over the internet. Are your GPS coordinates of where you're currently stood somewhat identifiable? That's fairly sensitive information. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to turn off the geolocation API when the site's on HTTP. Because if you click this button now and it works, this browser page has to send your GPS coordinates to the server. And we're on HTTP, which means everybody else gets to see your GPS coordinates as well. So Chrome said, no more. And they actually de deprecated several powerful APIs over HTTP because we don't want to leak that information. So you, now you press the button and nothing happens. But the problem is, Chrome announced this change. They wrote a lovely um, blog on their like developer blog. Hands up, who reads that? Anyone? Right, this is, you kind of see where I'm going already, right? <laughs> like, Chrome announced this change, and they were like, OK, we put all the information out there, but the problem is no one's reading the information. And I say no one. You know, like, generally speaking, there's not enough people that are going to go read that blog and say, hey, like in the next version of Chrome, we're going to turn this thing off. And we got to the date when this happened in the UK, and pretty much every store locator for all of the major chains stopped working. Because you come along and you press the button, and it's like, well, like, why is the, the thing not doing the thing anymore? Because they turned it off. But no one really knew that was coming. But now there is a way. If something like this was to happen again, the next deprecation is coming in any future version of Chrome, you can now ask the browser to tell you with a deprecation report. If you're using a thing on your page that currently works, but will not work in a future version, the browser will send you a report. And the browser will say, hey, we got the same JSON payload, the same schema as before, but now it's a deprecation report. Here is the page on which this thing happened, and here is an error message. Geolocation is deprecated over HTTP and will be removed in Chrome 50. So if you're using this, and let's say you were to get something like this, and you're like, oh, great, we've got this feature on our page that we're using, and in a couple browser versions, it's going to be gone. The problem is HTTP. Maybe we'll move this page to HTTPS before then. This works in Chrome now. Any feature that you're using on your page and Chrome intend to deprecate in the future, you can receive this information before it breaks on your website. And this is really, this is really cool. I really hope that we get wider support in the browsers for this very soon. So as I said, it is supported in Chrome now. But as more browser vendors add this, wouldn't it be nice to know that things are going to break on our site? And you'll only get these reports when something's going to be deprecated. If you're using features on your page and they're all fine, no reports. So the only time you'll hear something is when there's a problem. This is a really nice scenario for us to be in. But that's just deprecation reports. The browser can tell us more things about our site. Does anyone know what an intervention is in a browser? Has anyone ever seen one in the, like in the, in the console? So sometimes you go to a website, and the browser might say, oh, well, the connection that this client has is really, really slow, so I'm not going to load all of these large font files. I'm going to fall back to some default fonts. Maybe the website wants to do something really annoying. Like as soon as you land there, it plays a video and some loud sound. Has anyone ever seen when it pops up and says, like, this website has been blocked from playing audio? Or you've got like 500 tabs open, and it's like, which one's playing all the music? But it doesn't really happen anymore, because you need a user action to do that. That's called an intervention, when the browser steps in and says, because of performance security or user experience, I'm going to override something on this page. I'm not going to do what I was actually told to do. I'm going to do what I think is better. We call those interventions. And again, if they happen for whatever reason, the browser will send you a report and say, hey, I came to your website, and now I'm sending you an intervention report. Because you tried to play audio without a user action, which is really annoying. So we're not going to do it, and we'll tell you that we didn't do it. 
So then maybe you think, okay, perhaps we have to do this a bit differently. Maybe it's refusing to load your funds because lots of your users are on slow mobile connections and you don't know that they're having a subpar experience because the browser's not loading all the assets. But again, whatever they are, when the browser steps in and does something you were expecting it to do differently, you should really know about that. If the browser's having to take action on your site, you really want it to tell you. And this is what intervention reports will do. The last one of these four that I want to talk about is something called a crash report. And there's actually only one crash report that you can get right now. There's only one particular message. And it's kind of funny that Chrome is the only browser that sends these because it's probably the only browser that's ever going to send one. Now, the reason for these crash reports, as you can see at the bottom, is OOM. Does anyone know what OOM is? Um, yeah, everyone knows what OOM is when you're using Chrome. <laughs> So if you manage to consume like, all of the memory on the device and, and cause a crash in the browser, it will actually send you this report. Now, it's probably more likely Chrome's fault. This is recorded. I should remember that. It's probably Chrome's fault for consuming all the memory on the client. But again, it could be something your application is doing, something that's causing a subpar experience for your visitors. The browser has a crash. It will give you the crash ID, which you can then go look up with Chrome and say exactly what happened. Why did we experience this crash on the page? If it's a one-off, maybe just toss it away. Maybe it's not a problem. But if you're consistently receiving these reports, then perhaps there's something, maybe it's a bug in the browser. It doesn't necessarily have to be your fault, but there could be something happening that is a problem and you need to know about. So those are, those are all of the brand new capabilities. All of these came out in September last year when the, when the first version of Chrome dropped with them. And we're hoping to see more widespread support for these in other browsers over the coming months. I would really love to see the mainstream browsers have these this year, because I think a lot of the information here is really useful. But these aren't the only things that the browser can call home and tell you about. If something happens on your website, there's actually a lot more that it can tell you about. The idea of browsers reporting like this isn't particularly new. We're just adding more features over time. We've just talked about the most recent ones. But there's a lot of others that have been here for quite some amount of time as well. In the top left, we have content security policy. If you attended Troy's talk, he briefly touched on this and the benefits. With a content security policy, you deliver the page to the browser and you say, right, this is my website. And on my website, we only load JavaScript from jQueryCDN.com. Nowhere else, that's where we expect to load our JavaScript. So the browser's rendering your page and it's like, hey, this script tag has a source attribute that's like evilhacker.com forward slash keylogger.js. Now, we could look at that and, and, of course, think that that was bad. But the browser will look at it and say, the page is trying to load script from somewhere that the host wasn't expecting. So maybe this script tag shouldn't be there. The browser will just throw the script tag away and send you the report to say, hey, you told me that you would only load script from one place, but we actually found this script loading from here. Did you mean to do that? Now, if you get that report and you look at it and you're like, ooh, why are we loading script tags from this location? Maybe you've got a vulnerability. This would typically be a cross-site scripting attack on your site. Uh, HBKP, I love this one. Who attended Cyberbroken last night at the party? So quite a few people in here know about HBKP. This one is a really powerful mechanism, but is actually being deprecated in Chrome in 72, which comes out in like three weeks. It turned out it was a little bit too powerful, and people couldn't properly configure it and deploy it. And if you get HBKP wrong, you can lock the settings into the browser, and the browser will refuse to ever go to your site again if you get it wrong. So this is literally like the kill switch for your web. Like you can genuinely brick your website in Chrome for like a year. So this was really powerful. Lots of people got it wrong. We have a term called HPKP suicide, uh, which is when you misconfigure this and break your website. So this is actually going now, and I can remove this soon. They announced the, they announced the deprecation like a week ago. Uh, the next one, certificate transparency. CT is a really powerful mechanism that when you go to a certificate authority and get a certificate for your website, they have to log it in these public logs. And these logs are operated all around the world, and they're actually essentially the blockchain. So it's an append-only immutable log. So a CA will issue a certificate like scotthelm.com. He's got his new certificate. They must write an entry in the public log because there's got to be complete transparency around this process. If your certificate is not written into that log, the browser will not accept it because it could be like some secret you know, bribery deal, backhanded, you know, like, oh, we'll pay you a million dollars for this cert. Maybe a CA got compromised, maybe someone stole it. But they have to be completely 
public knowledge and public information. And if they're not, the browser will not accept it when it comes to your website. This is actually one of the TLS errors that we saw earlier in Nell. Now, your certificate authority is supposed to do this for you. And like 99.9% .9 of the time, this will be fine. But every now and again, we don't get things quite right. If the browser comes to your website and says, hey, this certificate isn't present in the CT logs. I can't see public knowledge of this certificate. I'm not going to accept it. I refuse to connect to your site. The browser will call home and tell you that you've either got a misconfiguration or something somewhere has broken. Bottom left, feature policy. This is another really powerful one that was introduced recently. Feature policy allows you to control really powerful APIs in the browser, things like geolocation, camera, microphone, all of the permissions that you can request to use things in the browser. Feature policy lets you control them on your site. If you never expect to ask the user for permission to their camera on your website, you can disable it in feature policy and say, this website does not need the camera. Turn it off. Because then, and the common scenario where we need this is if you're loading libraries, third-party code, JavaScript, executing, uh, sorry, loading adverts and, and libraries into your site, if one of those is requesting camera permission, the permission prompt pops up on your site. Right? Like if you've got an advert in your page that requests access to the microphone, all the user sees is there on your website and you're asking for microphone access. So in feature policy, you can just say, well, I don't need microphone on my website, so we'll just turn it off. If something then tries to access the microphone, off goes the report. Hey, why, why are we requesting microphone permissions on our website? What's happening? Maybe someone did it. Maybe it was a developer. Maybe it was a bad advert. But again, if something like that's happening on your site and the user's getting permission prompts, that looks like you. So you should really know that that's happening. Penultimate one, XSS Auditor. Again, Troy demoed this in his talk. It's a really good one. The XSS Auditor will only pick up a subset of attacks. So cross-site scripting, the ability for someone to get JavaScript into your page that shouldn't have been there. The, the demo that Troy gave was like a search box. So you, you type in a search term. The search term then gets rendered back into the resulting page. Type in a script tag, and the script tag gets rendered back into the resulting page and then executes. The XSS Auditor is built into Chrome, in fact, Firefox is the only browser that doesn't have one. And again, it will detect these attacks. And by default, it will take action. Whether or not you configure this, the auditor will take action. If the browser goes to a page and it says, wow, the user's under attack, like someone's literally trying to launch a cross-site scripting attack against this user, the browser will by default protect them from that attack. The difference and the problem is that you don't know unless you turn on reporting. And this is the really kind of key one for me with the auditor. The auditor's on by default, and the auditor will take action and protect your visitors by default. You just don't know. And, and I, it's kind of an odd one for me, actually. But I think I prefer this way. I think I prefer the idea of having the auditor on by default. But what you should really do is subscribe to the reports. And the really cool thing with the report is it will include the attack payload. So if someone's actually trying to launch a cross-site scripting attack on your site, and they can trigger an attack, the browser will take a copy of the payload and say, right, this is the thing that they put in the search box that attacked your user. So you can see exactly how that went wrong. And then the last one, OCSP expects staple. OCSP stapling, this is like a hardcore TLS feature, I guess. Um, it's a privacy and performance optimization you can deploy if you use HTTPS on your website. Again, if you're expecting this to work and it doesn't, you can say to the browser, hey, I was expecting to staple. If you come to my website and this thing isn't working, send me the report back and tell me. All of these are built into the browser. Everything on the previous slide, everything on this slide. There's no code, there's no subscription fee, there's no agent to deploy. You configure all of these with a HTTP response header. You set the header on your site and you say, look, if any of those or any of those go wrong, please tell me about it. So I just want to demo a couple of these in action before we move on to the next section of the talk, because beyond just the NAL reports that we talked about, there's some really cool stuff that you can do here. Oops, I didn't want to do that. I'll just go back to duplicate. Yeah, I actually did switch this time. So I want to demo quickly the CSP reporting here. Now, on this page, I have, in fact, actually, what we'll do, we'll look at this in a better scenario. 
So a security headers just grabs the HTTP headers for a page and lets us look at them. So if we take a, if we take a look at this, where are we? Here, this is a content security policy header. So you can see the CSP header here. Quickly, briefly mentioned what CSP was for a moment ago. And this is the header itself. Now, it doesn't look great in the first instance. It's kind of a little bit gnarly because I've developed my policy over the last couple of years. But you can see here things like script source. These are all of the locations that my website expects to load script from. If the browser comes to my page, and this page has a script tag whose source attribute is not in that list, it won't load it because those are the only places that I expect to load script from. Now, you can control all of the other types of content. We've got styles, images. Child source covers things like iframes. Who do you expect to iframe? Connect source, where can I make XHRs? Form action, super powerful. Go to the login page on your website and hit the submit button. Where should the form action be? Well, probably back to me, I would hope, because that's generally where you want to send your forms to, so you can control that as well. So I'm going to demonstrate what happens when something is in violation of the CSP. So I need to spin up Fiddler because all these reports get sent in the background. So we're not going to see any of this. I'm going to use Fiddler to capture the traffic in the background. Do I, what? What is your overall satisfaction? Well, zero right now. <laughs> so, and so these are the two domains that I want to see the traffic for. So if I go to this page again, I'm going to go down to this form. So we'll take a look at this form here. Now you can see the action on this form. I'm going to just zoom in so you can see that a bit better. This form is going to send, should send, the information to evil.com. Now evil.com, we just looked at my form action. Evil.com is not in there. So technically this should not be allowed on my website. And I'm going to actually rely on the browsers to do this. So username. Don't tell anyone my password and hit submit. But nothing happens. Should have submitted the form and gone on to do whatever it wanted to do. However, if we jump over to the console, there's an error down here that says refuse to send form data to evil.com because it violates the following content security policy directive. So this is number one CSP in action in that it's blocked something that Technically, it was supposed to happen, but according to the CSP, it wasn't supposed to happen. But number two, it will have sent a request about this. So if we jump over to Fiddler, I'm just going to stop it capturing now. We can see that we caught two requests here in Fiddler. So these were sent in the background. I went over to the network tab in the browser. There's nothing there. However, these still went out over the network. Now, the first one, because these are cause-enabled requests, the first one is the options request to see if we have permission to send the report, which we do. The second one is then the report payload. So if we zoom in on that, this is the actual traffic that Fiddler captures. So it doesn't matter which of the features that I just talked about, whether this is a network error log, deprecation report, crash report, when any of these things triggers, this is what happens in the background. So again, the blocked URI, I can see that on this page, CSP demo, which is where I was, something was blocked from evil.com, and it was a form action. Maybe this error message would be, hey, your certificate's expired because this is a network error log. Any one of those things will trigger these reports in the background, transparently and automatically. And all I have is those response headers. So that's the end of kind of the browser reporting section, because there's a couple more reporting things that I want to talk about that are not based on the browser. DMARC is the domain-based message authentication, reporting, conformance feature. DMARC is about emails. We have a problem with emails where if I receive an email and it says, let's say it came from Troy, it's like, hey, Scott, you've got this email from Troy at TroyHunt.com. Can I show your email? Is that OK? <laughs> Send Troy spam. So it says it was from this particular person at this particular domain. Now, how do we actually know? How do we know that when you receive an email and it says that it came from this alias at this domain, how do we know that it actually did that? How do we know that it was sent from them? How do we authenticate it? How do we make sure it's genuine and not fraudulent? 
So DMARC helps you to do this. DMARC helps you to make sure that no one can impersonate you. Because this is the problem, right? Like, you get this piece of text, and, it, and it's like, hey, for me, for reporturi.com, someone's trying to impersonate our company. And it's like, right, OK, hey, this came from reporturi.com, and it's a password reset. I must click this link. And this could be like a hyperlinked piece of text that is a trick link. But the problem is, well, it says that it came from us. And I really want a way for people to know whether or not that email definitely came from us at our company, because it could be someone trying to launch a phishing attack, someone trying to impersonate us and trick our users. So first of all, you have two different features that you have to de deploy for DMARC to work properly. Is anyone familiar with SPF? Wow, it's like four. Yeah. So SPF is really cool, and I, I find that there's not much knowledge of it out there. SPF is the sender policy framework, and it's a super simple DNS text record. Now, I set this DNS text record, and inside it, you put version SPF1, which is where we are in the spec, and then you include the addresses that you expect to send emails from. So this is actually a list of IP addresses. However, I use Fastmail as a mail provider. So I just point this to them and say, hey, go look up at this list of IP addresses, and this is where I will send emails from. When you receive an email that claims to be from me, it will come from one of the IP addresses listed here. Now, this is a really simple start to the process. If you're sending emails, they must originate from an IP address somewhere. SPF allows the receiver to check, hey, I just got this email, claims to be from Scott. We'll do this DNS lookup, and we'll check the IP addresses that it should have come from. Does the IP address match? This is the first of two mechanisms that we have to check against. The second one is DKIM, which is Domain Keys Identified Mail. This allows you to go a little bit further and add a slightly stronger protection because you can now put a cryptographic signature on emails. So you can actually sign emails coming from you to prove that they came from you. And you do that by putting the key into the DKIM record in DNS. So again, this is just another DNS record on my domain and when you receive an email from me, there will be a signature in the headers. You reach into DNS and you fetch the key, and you check the signature. Well, if this email came from Scott, then the signature must be valid, and it must be signed by Scott's key. So if you have a hosted email provider, if you're on G Suite, Office 365, Fastmail, whoever it might be, setting these things up is generally just copy and paste. It was literally just copy and paste for me, and it's copy and paste on G Suite as well. So they say, hey, go put these values in your DNS, and we'll do all of this for you automagically, which is awesome. It's an awesome level of protection to have for literally copying and pasting two DNS records. The, the, the kind of like the next step of that, though, is like, that's great, and I have all this protection, but is it, is it being used? Are there people out there actually trying to impersonate me? Are there things that I really should know about out in the big wide world? And this is where DMARC comes in, because DMARC allows you to essentially speak to all these mail providers and say, hey, like, are people out there impersonating me? Are you getting emails that claim to be from me but aren't? And this is a really powerful mechanism. So again, DMARC is just another DNS text record. You set the version, DMARC1 is where we currently are. And then the policy here, you can ask an email provider to do one of three things. You can say, look, don't do anything and just tell me, which is none. Quarantine, which is the one that I go for, generally speaking, this means put it in spam. Or as you'll see in a minute, put some kind of big warning at the top to say, this email claims to be from Scott, but it might not be. And then the third option is to just reject and throw it straight away. So I go for the quarantine option for now. And then the value here is where to send the reports to, where to send a notification. Hey, we're Google, and we just received an email that claimed to be from you, but wasn't. And Google will send me an email and tell me and say, do you know there's someone out there trying to impersonate you? If an email goes, and, and we'll send a, a test email to demonstrate this in a minute, if an email goes that claims to be from me but isn't, these checks will fail. Google will do this. So we're going to demonstrate this in a minute. We're going to send a spoofed email that claims to be from me but it's not. And Google will put this nice big warning at the top to say, well, it says here it's from test at reporturi.com. But they'll check the SPF record, and they'll check the DKIM signature. And they'll be like, well, these two things don't align. They don't match up. So there's a really good chance that this is not from who it claims to be. Slightly different on Microsoft. They just put these things straight to junk, which is kind of what we expect most of the time. 
But I think that I actually prefer a big overt warning like this. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I seem to spend a lot of time in my junk folder finding legitimate emails. So I think putting something in junk is not as, as kind of a powerful a signal as a big warning message like that would be. But what we can say is the provider received this email that claimed to be from us, and they weren't satisfied that it was from us. Big warning, or toss it to junk. So I want to show how this works out as well, and what the DMARC reports actually look like. Now it turns out, someone asked me, how do I send an email that claims to be from you when it's not from you? And I was like, oh, well, most things, you can probably just whack this in Google and find something. And I actually did. So I think I Googled this one. There you go. First link. It's super simple to send an email that claims to be from someone. So I'm just going to try sat in the front. So why don't I just pretend to be Troy? Oh, look at that. I already had Troy's name in there. <laughs> I impersonate Troy a lot. So you literally say, like, yeah, from, uh, from Troy Hunt, from Troy at TroyHunt.com to, let's send this to my Hotmail, subject test. Let's just put a body in there. Now, this will take a couple of minutes to go through. And this will essentially just craft an email. There we go, it's gone already. It will craft an email and it will set the, the false headers of who this came from. This will like zip over the internet now, it will land at Microsoft. And Microsoft will say, OK, right. You know, this email claims to be from troyhunt.com. First of all, they'll do the DNS lookup for the SPF record. Was the IP address of the server that sent this one of those listed? No. Then they'll do the DKIM lookup. Is the header signed with the key in Troy's DNS record? No. So hopefully that should go straight to my spam folder. We'll give it a couple of minutes because it, it does take a moment to check. But in my slides, I showed you an example one. And I actually did that test on the 21st of December last year. So I'm actually just going to jump into my report. So over on report URI because if I go back to the 21st of December last year when I did this very first test, we can scroll down through all my reports. Most things are green, most things are yellow, but then we get to this red one here. Now this is a report that came in from Google. So when that, when that email lands and it's spoofed or it's forged, the mail provider will throw it in junk, put a warning on it. But they'll also send me an email to say, we just got this email that claims to be from you and it's not. Here is all of the information. Now, unlike the ones we talked about before, which were JSON, this one's actually XML because it's a much older standard. However, the process, the principle is still exactly the same. I get this email from Google and I'll get one from Microsoft hopefully very soon. And it will tell me all the information about this, this forged email claiming to be from me that wasn't. Now, maybe not all organizations need this. Maybe you are an organization where people will try and impersonate you. People will try and send spoofed emails that claim to be from you when they're not. Could someone, if they started sending these to your users, cause harm? Could they get them to log into fake websites, provide details via email? So I think this is a really powerful mechanism. It's a really important thing to have. And I'm very quickly going to see if that's landed in spam. So it should have had time to go through now. So, ah, it's not there yet. Generally, it takes a few minutes to go through. Was it? Oh, that would be really bad. So this is my throwaway email address. So it is. I wonder if they put a warning on this. So that's really interesting because Microsoft should not be putting this in my inbox right now. This, this should have gone to junk or have some kind of flag on it. Let me just resend that. I'm going to do it to Gmail because Google tends to be a lot better with this. We can actually see this work, because I want to make this work now, because that should not have worked. Wait. Um, to send it to my other one. So we do exactly the same thing. Subject was test, I think, right? And then test in the body. Send. <laughs> Why did that not send? Go. I think that worked. There we go. So I'll carry on, and we'll have a look at that before the end, because I have about five minutes left at the end for questions, and we will check that, because that should not have gone to my inbox. So we'll jump back over. I'm coming up on the few minutes left, actually, and I do want to have the Q&A on this one. So we'll run to the end here, which brings me pretty much coming on time for the questions. So I want to actually open it up to the floor. 
because I do. I would like to have like a, kind of an interactive demo Q and A. If there's things that you want me to demo, we can do all of that now. So, are there any questions so far? Is there anything anyone would like to see in more detail? Yes. Hmm. Really good question. So the question there, there was a speaker that said you shouldn't whitelist CDNs in your content security policy. Uh, this is a really valid point to make. So actually, if I jump back out, I'll, I'll demo this as I show you. So my content security policy, I actually have a parser on here, which will give you a much prettier view. Um, CSP analyzer, and then... So if we look at my CSP on here... We can, I'll just zoom in a bit for everyone at the back. If we look at my CSP here, these are all the locations I can load script from. And if you look right here, cdnjs.cloudflare.com, which is Cloudflare's JavaScript CDN. Now, what this means is I permitted the browser to load any script from this domain. Now, it's a CDN. There's a whole crap load of script on that domain. There's like lots and lots of script on there. So the, the risk here with broadly whitelisting a CDN is that let's say if someone injects a script tag that's loading an old version of a library, that has a vulnerability in it. The browser will look at this and say, ah, well, actually, yeah, I can load this because it's on the Cloudflare CDM. Now, if you want to go more specific than that, with CSP, you don't just whitelist the domain. You can actually whitelist the path. So I could do like forward slash jQuery, forward slash 3.1.1, forward slash etc. So broadly, whitelisting a CDN does introduce the consideration that this can now load any script that's on that CDN not just the script that I want. So that is a valid point, but you can go down to path whitelisting as well to fix that. Uh, there was another, yes? Um, yeah, so you've got this report URI mm. website that, that handles all of the requests that are being posted to the, uh, yep. on the browser. So what, what are the, the sort of key capabilities of, of that site? You get the data, and what are the, what are the things that you want to be doing? So essentially, could I summarize that for the audience as what is the purpose of Report URI? Um, so, I mean, I guess it's kind of a good one. I started Report URI almost four years ago now, and it's a free project for anybody to use. I guess the number one thing really for me is you can just turn it on. Right? Like, if you wanted to go test this now, we have a free account, which will give you no credit cards, no... Not a sales pitch, I hate saying talking about this sometimes, but you get 10,000 reports a month absolutely free. No credit card, no nothing. So if you just want to try this out and think, I don't know if this is any good, like, do we want this? Is this going to be helpful? Just go sign up and send some reports and try it out. Whereas the alternative would be, all right, we need to spin up an Alk stack in AWS, or we need to, like, you know, build some UI somewhere to do this. So I guess for me, it was just lowering the barrier to entry. I, when I first started using these reporting features almost four years ago, and I actually started building it a long time before I released it, I was like, oh, these sound really cool. Like, I want to do that. So I Googled around. I couldn't find anything, and I ended up building a solution myself. And I was like, well, if I went through that process and, and got stuck with building it, maybe other people are put off by that. So then I just built a front end and put it online. And that's how the project started. So I guess really it's just an easy way of doing it. The old adage of like buy versus build. Uh, there was another one, yes. Don't you risk to have spoofing from malicious people who are trying to drown uh, your system by sending false reports? Okay, yep, so really good question. Um, I'll break that question down into two parts if I want. So essentially, the question was isn't there a problem with people sending A, large volumes of data to this, or B, spoofed reports as well? I'll address both of those separately if that's okay. Uh, number one, volume. This is the other kind of thing that ties into building it yourself. If you have a misconfiguration on your site, you can potentially get a very large volume of report data. Let's say you get something wrong in your CSP and you forget to whitelist your CDN. Every browser comes to your website and it will send a report back and say, hey, there's something on your website that shouldn't be there. <laughs> We've actually had a few customers um, do things like this and, and DDoS us. I actually have a blog post. If you're interested in just how much report volume you can generate, um, Scott Helm, CSP, DDoS. There. So I actually wrote about this. And this was really nice, actually, because this customer let me name them. And, and it wasn't to shame them. It was just to explain the process of how difficult this can be. If you deploy a misconfiguration, you can end up receiving... This one customer alone was sending us like 2.4 gigabits of CSP reports. I actually have the graph down here somewhere. So 
<laughs> yeah. We had low balances pulling like 35, 40 K reports a second. And one of our low balances peaked out, what was that? 550 megabits on just one of our low balances. That's 550 megabits of JSON <laughs> multiplied by six. <laughs> it was like, this is a lot of data. Interestingly, this email here is when our host dropped us, um, but just don't look at that part. <laughs> but this is why it can be really hard to run your own because there can be significant volumes here. The second part of that is then the spoofing part. These are unauthenticated JSON payloads sent as a post request. There's no way to make sure the legitimate source, because if some completely random browser comes to your website and experiences an error, they can send that. That there's no possible way to authenticate that or to check the legitimacy of that. You know, we do really basic stuff like schema validation on the JSON, basic bot detection for the browsers for the client, but beyond that, you're you're kind of just left that you always need to remember, you know, if you get a report that's just super crazy, it could be a forged report, but we're pretty good at filtering those now. We know how to spot a lot of them. Uh, there was another question somewhere. No, okay. Well, we've only got two minutes left till the end. If there are no, qu oh, sorry, there was one. He's waving. Hi. <laughs> Can you tailor a CSP for a specific page? That's a really interesting question. Uh, the answer is kind of yes, because CSP headers are delivered and enforced on a per page basis. So a CSP doesn't have a concept of being cached for any period of time. So you might say, okay, this is our payment page. Super sensitive, we're gonna lock down all the scripts, we're gonna go really basic and make sure that nothing gets in here. But across the rest of our site, we're a bit more relaxed. We can load assets from a CDN. So if you really want to, you can go to like a per page basis for a CSP. However, it's a little bit more maintenance and obviously you've got a configuration overhead there. Generally speaking, I only ever see people doing a site-wide policy. So they'll just, you know, kind of like mine. Both of my, in fact, all of my websites that I've just shown you all have a site-wide policy. Yes? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to open that on my phone first because my Hotmail is a throwaway address and I don't care you seeing my inbox. My Gmail is a bit different. <coughs> Let's have a look. Spam. Mm, no, inbox. It's not arrived yet, actually, but it's not in either, so it could just be still held up for processing. No, what I'll do is if it comes through or when it comes through, because I said before, sometimes it can take a few minutes from that service, I will, um, I will tweet a screenshot of it so we can see what that looks like. Yes? <laughs> Yep. Uh, am I right to say that it only works for people that put your site before? Yes. Yeah, so that's a really good point. The, the network error logging and most of the reporting functionality that we just talked about is what we call a tofu mechanism. It's, it's some kind of like trust or use on first use. And what I mean is that you must have been to my website at least once to cache the header so that the next time you visit and the DNS doesn't resolve, you remember it from last time. So you can't, you, you must have had the browser visit your website at least once for this to work, because that's where it will lock in the cache value and then remember it going forwards. So hopefully you deploy this on a good day when everything is working, and then tomorrow or, or next week, whenever you have a problem, the browser will remember the setting and report it. Any more questions? We all good. All right, I'm going to call it there because I've only got half a minute left anyway. Uh, thank you very much.